Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to serve you and to serve the body of Christ, the church. Thank you for this great privilege, not because of who we are, but because of your love, because of your mercy. You reserve such a privilege for us. And we pray, Lord, you help us not to forget ourselves. And not to think we are so great and that's why we are doing what we are doing. But to know that it's just because of your grace. We are praying, O oh Lord, we will not frustrate your grace in our lives in Jesus' name. That our service will be acceptable in your hand. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we are looking at First Timothy chapters, chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2. First Timothy chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2. First Timothy, Second Timothy and Titus are important epistles for those who are serving the Lord so that we know how to serve the Lord, how to present what we have before the Lord so that our service will be acceptable in his sight. Actually, these three epistles are referred to as pastoral epistles. And Paul the Apostle, inspired by the Spirit of God, helps us to know why the epistle was written in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mightest know, mayest know, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Uh, Paul the Apostle makes us to understand from the instruction he gave to Timothy, there is a way to comport ourselves in the house of God. There is a way to behave in the house of God. Actually, you know that every profession has its ethics of the profession. If you are a medical practitioner, there is a way that you have to behave. In fact, there are things you have to put your signature to. That I mean this profession. And to carry out that profession, there are some things you are told. You read them out. And then you see how you behave yourself. If you are in politics and you happen to be like the president of a country, vice president, or other positions, strategic positions, the constitution is there. And then there is a requirement where you are being sworn in that this is how you are going to behave, how you are going to lead. And in all the various professions also, you have uh, that kind of ethics. That uh, this is the way you live while you are ministering, or you are in your office, or in that ministry. If it is so for all those areas, how much more when it comes to serving the Lord? That's why Paul had to write to Timothy, and he said, Timothy, you know, the house of God, the ground, and the pillar of truth. There is a way you live, and it's a way you minister. And you need to know all this. That's why I'm writing this epistle to you. Today I'm considering just verses 1 and 2 of the opening chapter. Look at it. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord. Just those two verses. The title of the message tonight is Faithful Proclaimers of the Faith. The Faithful Proclaimers of the Faith. 
As we look at Paul the Apostle, he himself said, by inspiration, that the Lord made him to be a faithful proclaimer of the faith. In verse 12 of this chapter, it says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. As the Lord looks, looks at our lives, he will never put any unfaithful, disloyal person in his ministry. He looks at our lives and he sees that we are saved and we are committed to the Savior. And there is that faithfulness of heart, faithfulness of life, faithfulness to the Lord in secret and in public. He examines our lives. You know, uh, the Lord is not in a hurry to put somebody into the ministry. As he looks at everything and then he counts us, reckons us, judges us, faithful. He puts us into the ministry. And Paul the Apostle, by the grace of God, qualified for the ministry because the Lord, looking at his life, examining his life, counted him faithful. Now he's writing to Timothy. How about this Timothy himself? What do we know about him? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For this cause I have sent unto you Timotheus, Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. As the Lord looked at the life of Paul himself and saw him faithful, counts him faithful, reckons him faithful. He also knew that if he was going to put anybody into the ministry, if God was going to use Paul the Apostle to appoint anyone, place anyone in any part of the ministry, there's something he must be looking for, and that will be faithfulness. And if we are not in a hurry to appoint people, put this one there, put this one there, we must be slow enough patient enough to find out if these people are faithful to the Lord and faithful to their calling, the high calling, the holy calling, the heavenly calling, the vocation where we is they are called to live the Christian lives. And if we find people that are up and down, wishy-washy, falling and rising, and they come to us suffering, you know, counseling, and they tell us, well, I don't know why I'm always falling into this. I'm falling into this. And the way things are today, we ourselves become so unfaithful that we now say to keep this fellow in the service of the Lord will really help him. Because that will help him to attend the workers' meeting and attend the leaders' meeting, attend this, attend this. So to help him to be faithful. Is unfaithful now, is sinful now, is backsliding, rising, and falling now to help him to be steady. There's one thing to do put him in the ministry, then that will help him to be faithful. You are unfaithful yourself if you do that. There are times that uh, there are some leaders in the church, they have their favorites, they're not looking at faithfulness to the Lord faithfulness to the word all they're looking for is this this or that and because that is all they're looking for uh, the people that please them serve them and do whatever they want although those people are disobedient to the lord unfaithful to the lord you'll put them in the ministry you're unfaithful yourself the faithful proclaimers of the faith. Now, as you look at First Timothy, come back there. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In verse 1, we see Paul. That gives us point 1. A servant of the master. A servant of the master. We see in verse 2, we see Timothy. That gives us point 2. 
a son in the ministry a son in the ministry and then as we look at the epistles pastoral epistles and we see what paul was telling timothy having put him in place and telling him if he was going to appoint to other people there is something required the character the behavior the, the lifestyle of the people that get into ministry that gives us point number three sanctification before ministry sanctification before ministry point number one paul an apostle of jesus christ by the commandment of god our savior and lord jesus christ which is our hope the word apostle means someone that is saint is saint with a commission is saint to carry out something is saint to go and do something there is a higher power there is a higher authority and this higher authority has authority over this man and he calls him and he tells him to forsake his life's ambition. He tells him to forsake all his career, all the vision he had until this time. And he says, I created you and I've recreated you. I've saved you. I have an assignment for you. And my assignment takes priority over what you wanted to do before. Abandon your life's career. Go where I send you, a servant of the master an apostle apostolos somebody saint and he said i am the one saint by jesus christ and it is by the commandment of god that means then eh, there is an authority over me he said there is a commandment over me he said and i cannot act otherwise this is the commission the lord had given me and this is the commandment i have what else can i do and, and there may be people that will feel that Paul was unreasonable in abandoning his former career. He said, if I'm unreasonable, I, I'm unreasonable because I'm acting in obedience to the commandment of the creator, the final authority of the whole universe. Uh, you need to realize that when you come into the service of the Lord, if it is by the calling of the Lord, it is not by the appointment of your husband, if it is not by the appointment of your godfather i mean somebody in the church who just likes you and plays favorites if it is not appointment by coercion you know somebody pushing you dragging you must do it you must do it if it is not appointment by just uh, you know uh, favoritism if you put me there you know i've been in this church for a long time and it, it's like you know nobody knows me and it's like nobody appreciates me i'm not needed here if you want to show i'm needed here put me somewhere let me do something if it's not like that if the lord has called you then you realize this is by the commandment of the lord you are a servant of the master and in second timothy chapter one verse two verse one paul he says it again an apostle of jesus christ by the will of god according to the promise of life which is in christ jesus he says it's not my will this is not the will of my husband this is not the will of my wife this is not the will of my friend this is not the will of a godfather this is not the will of anyone this is by the very will of god begin to check up what you are doing is it by the commandment of the lord is it by the will of the lord and you see yourself as a servant of the lord completely under the authority of the one that had called you do you feel the commission the authority over your life by the commandment of the lord one by the will of the lord two in titus chapter one it says paul again a servant of god and an apostle of jesus christ according to the faith of god's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness he repeats it again now he says apostle is a servant uh, that means that paul he, he was always conscious 
And whenever I want, can you imagine something? Whenever I wanted to write, at the very beginning, he will remind himself, he will remind himself, I'm writing this, I'm preaching this, I'm sending this message, I'm holding this office, I'm standing in this place, I'm giving this instruction on the basis of the very fact I am called of God, an apostle, a servant of the Lord, by the commandment of the Lord, by the will of the Lord. It tells us in Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, and in verse 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, uh, which means then well, when you have this privilege to serve the Lord, it's not only Paul, but Timothy also. They are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to wake up and understand that you have any responsibility. That you are not serving man. He is supposed to be a servant of the Lord, a servant of the master. Actually, there's something interesting here. Something very interesting. And from the time that Paul the Apostle got converted, that very first day, the very first question he asked the Lord implied that he was going to be totally subject and submissive to the will of the Master. He knew that other lords have ruled over me. Other things have motivated me, directed me, controlled me. But now I'm going to be under another control. And that's why immediately he was, you know, speaking to the Lord and knew that this is the Lord. The question that came to him, Acts of the Apostles, chapter, chapter 9, verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? He said, I take you as my master now. I take you as my Lord. And he called him Lord. He said, Lord, you'll be the controller, the director, the master of my life. Now, I surrender everything. My career up till this time ceases. All my agenda, all my planning, all my vision until this time, I come to a full stop. Now, I want to start in a new direction. Tell me, Lord, what will you have me to do? That is what you come to before the Lord will put you in the ministry. And then he said, and the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city. It shall be told thee what thou must do. Uh, that, that clears something. We're servants of the Lord. And sometimes, sometimes, the Lord will not tell us directly. He knows what we should do. In fact, he is the one that will tell Ananias to go and tell him. Lord, why don't you tell him directly? Why don't you tell him, Paul, you're asking that important question. What will you have me to do? Here is what you will do. Lord, why will you have to send him to the city and delay him and tell another person to tell him this is what he will do to teach him humility? Because this man is coming from the Sanhedrin. And then I'm going to now show him what he's going to do. Let him go to the city. And the people he had persecuted, and the people he wanted to go and chain up and bring bound in chains into prison, I'm going to tell one of them, instead of telling him, so that they will tell him what he will do. Uh, the question you are then asking yourself is, how do you show that you are a servant of the Lord? How do you show that you are a servant of the Master? Do you examine your life at all? Do you examine your ministry? Do you find out whether the way you are carrying out the work, you're still a servant, a servant, a servant of the master? Do you accept authority over you, control over you? You know, that's what we need to examine. And... Uh, I, I, I will not be apologetic on such a thing that the Lord calls you and brings you under authority and as Timothy was under Paul so you happen to be under my leadership and as God directed Timothy through Paul the apostle so God directs your ministry through my leadership and that you must act as 
a servant to the master. And whenever there is anything to correct, we don't cover our mouth to correct it. We don't tremble and shake to correct it. We don't get timid and fearful to correct it. We're assuming that the Lord has called you. And that he called you because he wants you to be servants. Under an authority. And he says that you obey them. That have the rule over you. For they watch over your souls as they that must give account. And that wherever you are appointed... Then we can call you and say, brother, whatever the title, do it this way. Don't do it this way. And if you don't carry that out, then so as to help other people who are also having similar responsibilities as you have. Because, you know, understand, please. I cannot be calling everybody one by one, one by one. That will take too much time. If I see that, for example, in leading the various districts, that a coordinator has made a very costly mistake. And that costly mistake is affecting other coordinators. They are thinking, if so-and-so did it, and nobody talks, maybe it's right. So, to correct that... And show everybody how to behave. Conduct the service in the house of God. The time may come when we have to say now everybody sit up. The work we're doing in the district. This is how to do it. This is how to do it. That is how to do it. That's alright. That's some place. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know sometimes we forget. That we are stewards of the mysteries of God. We forget that we are servants under the master. And whenever we make any correction to purge the church, purify the church, straighten out the church, we get offended. My brother, would you rather that the church should be destroyed rather than you are corrected? Would you say that you prefer that because you made that mistake and others are making that mistake, would you say you prefer that nothing ever be said to correct that thing so that you will not feel unhappy? Do you count your happiness more important than the stability the steadfastness, the solidity of the church. Ah, if that is so, then you don't, you don't love God and you don't appreciate the honor and the glory of God. And that's the reason why once in a while we need to make corrections. Why are we just going to pack ourselves together here and never correct things that go wrong? I said on Sunday that the prayer warriors many many years ago we stopped them because they were interpreting dreams and they were saying if you ride bicycle in the dream that means you have familiar spirit if you saw your primary school classmate in the dream that means ah you are one of them you have familiar spirit if you etch this in the dream that means you are one of them now that's why we stopped at that time. But that later, as pastor a father, I said, well, the people need to be prayed for. Uh, they need assistance. They need prayer. So we brought back the prayer warriors. And we have discovered now that the same reason why we cancelled it many years ago. That same interpretation is coming back again. And there is suspicion. So and so is a witch. So and so is a witch. So and so is a witch. And sometimes two sisters cannot visit one another and eat. Because I'm afraid she'll give me something to eat. They are planting fear in the hearts of people in the district. And they're negative. 
the words of jesus that said these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they shall cast out devils and that if they drink any deadly sin tell me the rest oh, why are we why are we warning members of the church directly and indirectly be careful of sister so and so be careful of sister so and so if you go to their house and you eat you get it what do they get how about that promise of god well forgetting the bible suppose they even have that evil spirit and they give you something to eat you don't believe in the name of jesus anymore and you lay your hands on that thing in the name of jesus i purify this food swallow everything poison and whatever just swallow if you do that in faith you'll be getting as big as i am <laughs> but are you afraid you can't eat the fellow has provided the thing good luck to her if she is a witch are they going to cut short a minute out of your life the number of your days counted and if you are righteous who can kill you who can destroy you if god be for us who can be against us what is the witch you know do not let sister so and so live in your house because she has family she will kill kill you jesus said my time is not yet are you going to that place again my time is not yet they wanted to kill you the other time are you going to step my time is not yet and the lord will fulfill everything concerning me why are we planting faith fear instead of planting faith in the hearts of people and then separating families brother I don't want to double into your family affairs, but you know, I'm a member of the prayer warriors. And while I was praying, well, I, I want you to take this with a pinch of salt. Uh, take it as a man. Take it as a man. Check up when you get back home. That's your wife. And the things that happen, check up. Although you don't say directly, are we not intelligent adults? You are saying that the wife is a witch. And the fellow then, he doesn't love his wife anymore. As Christ loved the church. And that's why we tell them privately. And those we know, don't say that. Don't do that. Don't lead like that. You're misleading those people. It's not right. But they don't stop. And there are other districts that are doing that. And so we have to correct it publicly. And when we do... Are people that kick they don't love truth and what they want is they want all the white garment incense burning water drinking oil smearing they want you to come to the church they prefer that and why should the pastor correct that why shouldn't he correct that we're servants to the master and because we're servants whatever needs to be corrected will be corrected must be corrected and if you reject correction it means to become unfaithful and if the lord shows us that you are no more fit to be there we'll take you away from there there are other people better than you who can be there if we see that you don't want to be taught the word so you can teach other people the word as servants, we need to be submissive to the word of the Lord. I go to point number two. What's point number two? Okay, I, I remember myself. It's there on my outline. I thought maybe you will not, uh, you know, answer properly. Because nowadays, once you, you know, correct something and this is not good, this is not good, then we, we react. Thank God you are not reacting today. I said you are not reacting today. Uh, you know, in a family, father and children, there are times to, you know, put things right. And you just need to love your father more when he corrects you. Point number two. A son in the ministry. In First Timothy chapter 1 verse 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. And that's the wonderful thing about this, Timothy. It was a real son. And in fact, 
it's like every time Paul has to mention Timothy, and that's what he calls him, legitimate son, a true son, a son that makes the father joyful, happy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, he even adds other adjectives to qualify the kind of son that Timothy was. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1, thou therefore, my son, my son, can I say that? Look up here. This Timothy we're talking about, by the way, experts and theologians tell us, it was between 30 and 36. And he said, my son, son in the faith, son in the ministry. Are there not some of us that, you know, we look at ourselves and we think that now we are this old. Why should he be talking to us like that? Doesn't he understand? What do you want him to understand? 20 years ago, when you were born again, this was this little man here was your father in the faith. A father is always a father. As the son is growing, the father is growing. And as old as you are now, if your physical natural fathers are still alive, you're still son. And you daughters. Before you got married, you were daughters. After getting married, having six children, even though you're senior me now in childbearing, you're still, you're still my daughters. I, I about your dad that has only two children, and you now have six, you're still his daughter. Whatever we become, whatever we are, that doesn't change the, the fact that the father is still father and the daughter is still daughter and the son is still son. And so, as Paul the apostle was growing, Timothy was growing, and Paul always referred to him as my son in the faith. And that's the way a son will behave. That's the way a real, real daughter will behave. In second in first Corinthians, first Corinthians chapter four, verse seventeen. First Corinthians four, verse seventeen. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son. Every time referring to this young man, my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in christ as i teach everywhere in every church i'm going to send timothy to you and when he comes i, I know i know that son he's not going to take away from anything he's not going to add anything either he's going to tell you exactly as i teach in every church in every place that's a son a son that will not deviate and branch off Oh, I, I know there are kind, many kinds of sons in the world. We're talking of church. We're talking of the grace of God. And we're talking of those who are influenced by the Spirit of God, by the word of the Lord. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. And that's what you should strive at. That you will be such a son in the faith. That somebody, your father in the Lord can say, I have nobody like that man, like that woman. He takes correction. She takes correction. Nobody like that individual. It says, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's, but ye know the proof of him, that as a son of the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. 
as a son with the father he has served with me in the gospel the question is what are the characteristics of true sons well we see from the life of jesus christ the characteristics of a true son a son to the father in john chapter 8 john chapter 8 verse 28 then said jesus unto them when ye have lifted up the son of man then shall ye know that i am he and that i do nothing of myself that's the characteristic of the son i do nothing of myself but as my father has taught me i speak these things and he that sent me is with me the father has not left me alone for i do always those things that please him that's the characteristic of the son i do always those things that please him now when you think and when you talk about sons in the faith uh, that means that is we're not talking of you know natural birth into a family in joshua chapter 11 joshua chapter 11 verse 15 because joshua was like a son to, to moses and moses was like a father of course to him both in age as well as in ministry in joshua 11 verse 15 as the as the lord commanded moses a servant so did moses command joshua and so did joshua he left nothing undone of all that the lord commanded moses i uh, you know sometimes uh, maybe it's because sometimes it's because we're together here perhaps we well, shouldn't be like that the greater privileges we have the greater loyalty faithfulness we ought to have but uh, the point is and uh, some of uh, my sons in the faith not living here not staying here far away but uh, they demonstrate faithfulness I just uh, i saw you know region of us yeah i didn't know what the region of us actually wanted but right. wonderful you are here today isn't it wonderful you know i started discussing and you know but she was a little bit serious i said ah, ah something is wrong and then the wife my sister have i met you before yes you met me when you came to our area this and that that's your boy that's your son very good wonderful what's the what's the matter well something serious our son did something bad and we feel that you ought to know about it have you told the state of us here well we wanted to tell him but we have not got chance to tell him but we just feel that we need to travel down here you must hear it you are our father in the lord and then they narrated the whole thing and i asked do you understand what this child has done and i i tried to minimize what the child i said maybe the child is using adult vocabulary maybe the child is using that big word they said no that we interviewed the child very well the child is of age the child knows what he's saying the vocabulary is using what he said he did is what he did and i try to see whether uh, they are carrying it to they said no no the child actually did that thing and i said do you understand the step we are to take as a result of they said yes we know i said what oh that we are unqualified to continue in ministry because this is what our boy has done we need to settle that with the lord i said how are we going to handle this because if you go back to your region now and you just see now you are not preaching the leaders over there will be wondering what has happened to our pastor overseer how do we handle this oh they you know very quickly they just said they have to be informed that this is what has happened and that's why we're sitting down 
I say, what? Faithful people? How is it that those who are here with me, seeing me on Sundays, hearing me on Monday, hearing me on Tuesday, if, if their boy, if their child did anything like this, they'll be, they'll be covering it up and wondering, I hope nobody goes to tell the pastor. And if I know about it, and then I said, ah, my brother, my sister, see what your child has done. They'll be threatening me. They want to run away to another place. You're running away from your father's house because you did something. I'm, I'm the one to suffer the punishment of what your child has done. That's not how to be a son in the faith. Let's carry out this work of God in the way it ought to be carried out. Without complaint, without murmuring, without grumbling, let's uphold this standard together. See Joshua. Moses had gone. Moses was no more there. And yet, Joshua carried out everything. The way he ought to carry out everything, even though Moses was not there. That is the characteristic of a son in the ministry. In Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Verses 3 and 4. For I was my father's son. Tender. Tender. Hey, let's be tender. Hey, you know, don't become, you know, so difficult. Hey, don't prove that you are tough. You may prove that you are tough to those people outside. And when you come before your father, when you come before me, when you relate with me, and I relate with you, if you are a son, if you are a daughter, you'll be tender. Only beloved in the sight of my mother. And he taught me and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words. Don't, don't, don't throw away what I say. If I'm your father, you know, one of our, our brothers around here, good, good brother, he saw me some time ago and, you know, told me about God won't seem to work for God. Do this and do this. I said, good, my brother. Go and sit down. Be doing what you want to do. What you are doing in where we placed you. When the time comes, God will settle everything. Whatever he wants you to do. This little me here, God will use me as your father. You will do what you need to do. And eventually after some, a few weeks after that, Maybe he was thinking that pastor has too many things to think about. How can he be remembering me here? I'm the one that knows that I need to do this, I need to do this. So, he sent in a letter of resignation and said, Dear Father in the Lord, and you know, thank God for what God has used you to teach me and to do and everything. And, uh, but, the pressure is on me. This is a call of God. I'm the one that knows the call of God. This is what you do. And then sent in the letter to me and copied the church so they can put it in the file. I didn't talk. I didn't send for him. I just felt that a father is a father. If this person is addressing me, their father in the Lord, he's a son. He knows what to do. One day he will come. If we don't see here, we'll see on the other side. You don't, you don't, you know, break your leg and break your arm because of these little, little things. Eventually, they, he came. And I said, you remember me today? And he said, yes, I always remember you. I said, no. Oh, you are my father. I said, me? <laughs> Look at my face. I'm your father. See the letter you wrote to me. And you didn't discuss this thing with me. I said, so and so, you can do this. And then he became serious and sober. And he had parked away from where he was. He's not living in another place. I said, you call me father? He said, yes. You're still my father. 
if I am your father, I'm not going to say a sentence. Go back to where you put your load. Pack everything. Go back to where God used me to put you and be doing whatever you need to do there. If you do that, I know you are a son. He bent down his head. He said, I cannot do anything contrary to what you say. I prayed. I felt the Lord was leading me. I'm reaching my letter. And I packed to another place. But now, you talk to me as a father. He said, I'll go back there. I don't care what people say. And I don't care what they will think. I'm going to pack my load again and go back to where I was. I said, uh, okay, you'll need to write another letter. And cancel the one you wrote. Ah, he said, father. If the first letter remains in the file. And then I write another one. The thing is still there. I'm a son now. Instead of my writing another one, why don't you take that other one I wrote and do like a father and tear it? I said, you're a real son. We prayed together. You know, that, that makes you to know there are still some people that are real sons indeed. And I pray you'll be like that. You'll be a daughter also. Where are the sisters? Where are you? I can't see you. Stand up and let me see you. Ah, see you. Are you there? Are you real daughters? Uh huh. If you are real, real daughters and your husband wants to take a wrong decision and you are planning secretly with your husband and you, and you kick me offside, you and your husband, and you settle everything. And your husband writes letter, resignation. And you are my daughter. And you read the thing. Send it to the pastor. You. You will change today. If your husband wants to take any step like that against your church, your father. Uh, you say, my husband, don't do this one. No. If you go. You go without me. I will not support that ministry. Because I am a daughter to that man. To that pastor and you you are son to that pastor if it were not his ministry in my life in your life this family will not be like this you will not enjoy me as you're enjoying me if you do that count me out that's a real daughter in the face but when your husband wants to take a step and you say hurry up hurry up go and do it that's not faithfulness I pray God will help you to be faithful in Jesus' name. You can sit down. Let your heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. Point number three. Sanctification before ministry. Our lives must be holy, pure, righteous, sanctified. If we are going to actually be ministering. In 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work, sanctified, ready, suitable for the master's use. I pray the hand of the Lord will be upon you. The anointing of the Lord will increase in your life. Where you are weak, the Lord will make you strong. All these that we are hearing will make you a faithful son, a faithful daughter. This work of God will prosper in your hand. The Lord needs you. We need you. Only let us do it with the heart of sons and daughters. You will not lose your reward in this life or in the world to come. Let's rise up and pray. Let God give you the grace to be faithful. You can be faithful. You will be faithful. And the